Some of you um, have come out tonight just because you're curious about what the rabbi has to say, but so many of you are just like me. I wonder if you would do me a favor tonight. If you're one of those people who, like me, has had your world turned upside down by this man, would you please stand up? More than 40 years ago that I recognized that my people were under assault by evangelicals who wanted to rob them of their faith. I say this to you, growing up in, in Brooklyn, I didn't know any nice non-Jews. I didn't think they were out there. I was born 15 years after the Holocaust, and it was a common sight to see elderly people with numbers on their arms. You didn't walk around neighborhoods in Brooklyn and people walked over to you who were Christians and say, ah, oh, good morning. <laughs> How is your day today? That never happened. If you saw someone who was not Jewish as a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s and you saw someone who definitely was not Jewish, you cross to the other side of the street to avoid what was inevitable. I thought non-Jews were insane. I didn't want to help them. I didn't want to reach out to them. For some reason, they were committed to the destruction of my people. It did not make sense to me. And when I was told that I killed Christ, I was baffled and would just tell them I was not even in the neighborhood at the time. It made no sense to me. But the world was very neat. It was carved up very nicely. You had people who were Jewish and they were safe to be around. People who were not Jewish and those are people you completely avoided and you were fine. But then changes occurred. I began to meet people who were not Jewish, who were devout, devout Christians, who had a great love for Jewish people. And that upset my world because it didn't fit. And I wanted the world to know about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And suddenly these people really mattered to me a lot. My work was not set out to help people who were not Jewish. My work was set out only to protect Jewish people who were lost in the church. It was inconceivable to me that any Jew would convert to Christianity, and I just wanted to protect them. But meeting people who were not Jewish and clearly had a, a great love and affection for the Jewish people blew my mind away, and I had to reset everything. Last night, we spent some time together with many of you sitting in this audience right now listening to my voice. And you asked about the messianic age, the events that will unfold in the final redemption, which I believe we are now observing. We have front row seats. I really have front row seats because I live in Jerusalem. And I hope one day to meet all of you there in the holiest place on earth. Okay? A transformation of the world, the ingathering of the exiles. God is going to bring us all home. There are many of you sitting here tonight who think that you're not Jewish, but you will discover that perhaps you are. But God is, there is an awakening going on today that has never really occurred in history since the time of Ezra. 
It's a remarkable moment of renaissance, a transformation. When the messianic age unfolds, there will be a, a temple will be built in Jerusalem. The entire end of the book of Ezekiel describes what the final temple will look like. And then the nations will know that I am Lord when your sanctuary is in your midst. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26 through 28. 41 through 47 contains the unused blueprints of the messianic temple. Transformation and ingathering of the exile that is so remarkable, Jeremiah of blessed memory tells us in chapter 16 that in those days, in the messianic age, no one's going to even be talking about the going out of Egypt. The exodus is just not going to be on the lips of people because the marvel of the moment that is going to happen where the Jewish people will not be brought from one land but from all parts of the land, I will bring you home. <laughs> Tanakh describes very vividly in the Messianic age of the reaction of the non-Jewish world to this profound moment. Tanakh tells us that the nation's world will be shocked, stunned. Isaiah 41, verse 11, they'll be confounded. This is like nothing they'd ever imagined, nothing they ever thought could ever occur. So will he cast down many nations. Kings <gasps> will shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told to them, they will consider that which they have never heard. They will finally understand me, Hem Lishmu Asenu, Uzreya Hashem, Amin Nicholas. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who would have ever believed this? Complete surprise. Look to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed. Shock and awe, ten Gentiles of different languages will grab the shirt of a Jew. Kanaf Yehudi, it says that. And say, I want to go with you because I have heard that God is with you. And when God's with you, you fear no one. Utter shock. And you can understand why the nations would be so stunned. You know, the, the early church fathers, they looked at a Temple Mount that was destroyed, and all of them with one voice said that the destruction of the temple marked the destruction of the Jewish people. The destruction of the temple occurred because the Jewish people rejected the Lord whom they killed, whom they murdered. With one voice, they spoke this way, whether it was anti nicene church fathers, such as Justin, Irenaeus, Ignatius, the earliest of the church fathers, all saw the destruction of a temple and the destruction of a Jewish commonwealth as a symbol of the destruction of the Jewish people and that the church has now superseded the nation of Israel. God was done with the nation of Israel. They all said this with one voice. Origen, third century church father, Jerome, all expressed the same thought. God was done with the Jewish people, and now there is a new covenant. And God was done with the old, and whatever has been made old waxes away and disappears. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. In fact, the entire book of Hebrews, all 13 chapters, are devoted as a polemic, as an argument against the Jewish religion and the superiority of Christianity. In fact, that's how the book of Hebrews begins. Some of you know this, you went to yeshiva. I'm kidding. <laughs> Hebrews chapter. Are these jokes too advanced for you over here? I said. The book of Hebrews begins. How? You remember about the long, in long time past, God spoke to the prophets. And they gave them a message, but now there's a whole new message. And Jesus is superior to the angels, Hebrews chapter 1. He is superior to Moses. After all, Moses was only a servant, but Jesus is a son, superior to Joshua. He is not just any high priest. He's above all because he has a, a priesthood, according to Melchizedek, swings all the way through. He is our Sabbath, Hebrews chapter 4. He is our everything. He is our sacrifice. In fact, there is no longer any need for a sacrificial system. It has been 
completely replaced by Jesus. Minor problem is the Hebrew Bible explicitly tells us that when Mashiach comes, the third temple will be built in its full order with a full sacrificial system and the Messiah himself is going to bring a sin offering on behalf of himself and the nation of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, if the Messiah is the sin sacrifice, then why would he be bringing the sin sacrifice? If the Messiah is sinless, why would he bring a sin offering? It's time for the church to wake up. King David, a great man of God, who made mistakes in his life. King David is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible more frequently than any other man. And he made mistakes. But he was confronted with a, with, by the prophet named Nathan. He was told a story, a parable, a juridical parable. The rich man and the poor man. Rich man has a guest at his home. King David made mistakes in his life that some of you have never done. When the rich man had a guest at his home and stake, instead of taking one of his many sheep, he took the poor man's one sheep. He prepared it and served it to his guest. And King David said, surely that man should be put to death. And Nathan said, you are that man. And King David, in two words, solidified a covenant. Chatasi Lashem, I have sinned before the Lord. And Nathan saw his heart and said, the Lord has already forgiven you. An eternal covenant was forged with King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. It can never be undone. Let them hear that at Dallas Theological Seminary. Let them hear that at Fuller Theological Seminary. I want them to hear that at Moody Bible Institute, where the Bible is your middle name. Read the scriptures. Go back to the Hebrew Bible. It's time to rethink your theology. And when the book of Hebrews quotes King David, King David is deeply moved by this. King David understood that in his own life, God forgave him. One of the reasons people don't repent in the view of the Almighty is that our self-esteem has been shattered. In the view of Tanakh, the reason if, if repentance and forgiveness is so really accessible, then why don't people repent? In the view of Tanakh, we think that God behaves like you and me. We sometimes have trouble forgiving those who hurt us deeply. And when we, then we create God in our image. We then, because I have not forgiven my sister, I haven't forgiven my ex-spouse for what he did to me, God certainly is not going to forgive me for the things that no one knows, my deepest, darkest secrets. He'll never forgive me. What is the point? And God says, no, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As the heavens are the higher than the earth, so too are my ways higher than your ways. I will forgive you, Isaiah 55, verse 6, 7, 8, 9. If you read those passages, you will repent today. King David spoke about this redemptive process of God. In Psalm chapter 40, verse 6, King David said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Oznayim karisali, you have opened my ears. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. In Christian theology, that's impossible. If you go to church, it's what you hear every, every Sunday. Is There's not, nothing you can do to save yourself. You're lost. There is no works. There is no effort. There is no initiative of yours that can save you. There is nothing you can do to bring about. You can't earn your way into heaven. If you have never heard what I just said, that means you grew up in Borough Park and never left. <laughs> That's every Sunday. That's every Bible class. You can't earn your way into heaven. There's nothing you can, nothing you can do to save yourself. Young man, it's only the blood of Christ that can save you. It's only the blood of the unblemished land that can save you. It's only Calvary. It's only Golgotha. There is no salvation outside of the cross. You can't do it. Theoretically, you can try to do it. Theoretically, you can say, but it's never going to be enough. So if there is one God and one mediator to man and God, and that is the man Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. That's it. There is no other path. So what is King David saying? That you just talk to him. He's waiting for you. God loves you more than you can ever hope to love him. 
The book of Hebrews doesn't like that verse. Doesn't appreciate Psalm 40, verse 6. And changes it. So in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, the passage reads, Sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. A body you have prepared for me? What? How do you change the word of God? How do you alter the sacred text of the children of Israel? And if you're going to change scripture, if you can alter scripture, do you think that I'm going to get baptized? How, how, how do you? And the book of Hebrews continues in verse 18. In that Christ died, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. God is done with the whole entire sacrificial, sacrificial system. Because after all, how could the blood of bulls and goats really atone for sin? It was only a temporal system in Christian theology. In Pauline thinking, the sacrificial system never really worked. Because there is an implicit question. And the implicit question is, well, if the Jews had a sacrificial system, they had the blood of bulls and goats and that could atone for sins what do you need Jesus for why don't we just keep going with the animals so the point of Hebrews is saying that whole system was just a foreshadowing Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 the foreshadowing that this Pauline language Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 and 17 let no one tell you about what you eat you drink Sabbath holidays let no one tell you about anything because all the law is just a shadow but the essence is Christ this is the foundational Pauline theology that's taught from churches all over the world. But I got a Bible. I have Tanakh. There is no salvation outside of that book. There is nothing. And all I want to do for you is to give you the gift that my family gave to me. In fact, the the promise at the end of the day is the most important, the central, the most core messianic prophecy is the redemption of the world. Abraham, a blessed memory. Abraham brought 70 souls to the God of Israel. Moses was responsible for an exodus, but the exodus... Uh, marked a moment in history in the year 2448 after creation where a single nation was delivered from Egypt, physically, spiritually delivered. The messianic age is the time for the redemption of the world. Welcome home. That's what we're watching right now. We're watching events that are unfolding at this moment where people are coming to learn about the God of Israel There's a term that's been used, and I, I want to talk about that term for a moment, and that's the term Noahides. Noahides. There are some very special people in this room, I'm not going to embarrass them, They're very special people, pioneers in the Noahide movement, but it is important to know that the Noahide movement is Judaism, and it's the oldest iteration of Judaism. It's that Judaism that predates Mount Sinai. That's the Judaism of Noah. Jewish people are very unique in that we are an ethno-religious group, an ethno-religious group. There's almost no other people like us, which means that the Jewish, we're, first we're a nation, right, and a faith, right? There's almost no other people like that, a nation and a faith. There are some people who say, I want to convert to Judaism in that I want to embrace Judaism as my religious faith. Okay? I'm not going to, right now, I don't feel the calling to join the Jewish nation, but I want to be in love with the God of Israel, and Judaism is my religious faith. It is my path to God. So we have this term, Noahide, that describes it. It's, it's, I wish it's an anachronism, and it's very confusing, and I want to get rid of that word for our time together tonight. So when someone becomes what's called a Noahide, what it really means is that that person is converting to Judaism, joining the Jewish faith, but not joining the Jewish 
nation. As such, they accept upon themselves the very commandments that Noah kept observed, his children and grandchildren who were loyal to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who would come along and would solidify a nation. Because there are some people who say, wait, I, I want to join the nation too. I want to join the nation of Israel as well. And those are people who we colloquially call people who convert to Judaism. So the word term is ger. But the word, the Hebrew word ger really means a stranger. That's really what it means. It doesn't mean convert at all. What God is doing is there are people who have, who are descendants of Jewish people, but for whatever reason, going back 80, going back 130, going back 240 years, parents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents converted to Christianity, to Islam, to any religion, and now they feel a calling to come back. They don't, they're not aware of their Jewish identity. They're strangers. It's really where they belong and they don't know it, but now we're living in a very special time where people are waking up and are being drawn closer and closer, and they say, I want to join not only the Jewish faith, but I want to join the Jewish nation as well, okay? So now we're gonna use terminology, both of them, in both cases, the person is converting to Judaism, in both cases, except we don't use that term any longer, but that's what it really is. For a Jewish person who's born to a Jewish mother, there are 613 commandments. Many of them do not apply to a whole bunch of people. Many commandments are only assigned to women, some only to men. There are commandments that, if you're, that are for you if you're not blind. There are commandments like if you steal, v'heshev agzel asher gozal, you have to return that which you stole. So you don't have to go steal something. You don't have to go rob a bank in order to fill another mitzvah. Okay, so there are commandments. There are about 130 commandments that apply to a sacrificial system. Children of Aaron have unique commandments that apply only to them. There are about 279 scriptural commandments for the Jewish people today. For the B'nai Noah, for those who embrace the Jewish faith but do not join the Jewish nation, they, there are what's called seven Noahide laws. This too is a misnomer. I want to use plain, easy language. So there are really seven categories of laws, and they are at first glance completely logical and moral laws. They are not ritualistic laws except that you must worship God and it's forbidden to commit an act of blasphemy to worship idolatry. Never to murder. A prohibition against stealing. Be honest. Make sure you pay your employees on time. That can hold back the coming of the Messiah by simply not paying your employees on time. Being careful with animals. There are some religious Jews who worry about having a pet because they're having a pet. Because there are so many laws assigned to how to care for your animal. If you come home from a day's work and you're hungry and your dog's hungry, Guess who gets to be fed first? You guessed it, right. So a lot of the laws associated with caring for an animal and preventing suffering to an animal, okay? So these are all commandments that are rational, that make sense to us, that instinctively make sense to us. So there's a caveat, and that caveat is that when someone carries out such a mitzvah of the, these seven Noahide laws, they must do it because the God of Israel commanded them. When you go to Walmart and purchase something and the cashier gives you change, but there are two $20 bills that are brand new so they stuck together, stop and say, the God of Israel commanded me to be honest and I'm doing this because I love him with all my heart. Turn back to the young men and say, you gave me $20 too much. You have a place in the world to come. There are many people, and that's why this is so germane for us tonight, 
who kind of seeing being a Noahide as a watered down Judaism 1.0 and the other Judaism as 2.0. There are many people who feel that, well, like, why is it so important to be a Noahide? Like being a Jew, there's so many more commandments. And if you think that the restoration of the nations of the world is not critical to the God of Israel. It is the center of all messianic prophecies. God wants you home. V'hoyo Hashem l'melch ha'kol God will be king over the whole world. He will be one. His name will be one. The whole world. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. In fact, the whole end of the book of Zechariah is consumed with non-Jews. Their restoration. Their coming back. They're coming to the Jewish people saying, we want to be with you. And God will refine them like gold through a fire. And they will keep the festival of tabernacles, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Because they stood with the clouds of heaven rather than Gug, the people of the roof. That's what Gug means in Hebrew, it means a roof. So the people of Gug in Ezekiel chapter 38, what is that? It's a, collabor a conglomeration of, of nations under the leadership of Persia that go to war against Israel, and they're called Gug. Well, what's Gug? Like, what country is Gug? Well, Gug in Hebrew is a real simple word, it means a roof, right? So the people who trust in the roof, in steel in, um, enforced, con steel enforced concrete roofs, go to war against the people who trust in the clouds of heaven. That's why the Messiah will come, a son of man, like a son of man, with the clouds of heaven. What is he doing with clouds of heaven? Why does he need clouds of heaven? Ah, those are the clouds. So you have a choice at the end of days. Are you going with the roof people or the cloud people? Oh, you're going to put your trust in the clouds of heaven? I have an eternity waiting for you. And you're all going to celebrate Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles. Why? Because the schach, the covering of the Sukkot, represents what? The clouds of heaven. Tanakh is so delicious. It's so beautiful. It's so yummy. Really, it's very, very special. So why the emphasis on the non-Jew? Why is it so important that they're brought into a covenant with God? As it turns out, the Noahite has a very unique opportunity. In a strange way, it's an opportunity that Jews, in a way, don't have. In that, the ritual commandments that a Jew keeps, making Kiddush on Shabbos. Some of you, we spend Shabbat together making kiddush, so when you make kiddush, right, or man puts on tefillin, phylacteries, there's no way out of it. You have to assign that behavior to God. There's, there's no reason to keep the Sabbath holy unless God commanded it. You, there's no rational reason for it. It, it. There's no other way to practice that commandment except with the full knowledge that I'm doing it only because the God of Israel commanded me. But people who are B'nai Noach, meaning those who've joined Judaism in faith, their commitments are all rational, which means a person will say, yeah, oh, the reason why I'm moral in my life, not because I'm God, I just think it's the right thing to do. It's me. The reason I'm honest in business has nothing to do with God. This is a me thing. The reason why I, I don't harm other people and I care about animals is just me. You have a way out. And therefore, it is the Noahide that can bring the glory of Hashem. It is the Noahide that can raise it up. It's so core and central to the final redemption. It is for this reason that the Bible speaks repeatedly about finally the, the sons of them that despise you will come to you, Isaiah chapter 60. That's why these messianic prophecies are so critical to us. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining me here tonight. May we merit to witness the coming of the true Mashiach quickly in our time where all the nations, all the nations, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9 will speak in a pure speech. Thank you. Thank you.
גדול עולם, אשר מלך בטרם כה.